Good morning, everyone. I welcome you all to the analysis of Hindu newspaper on 15th of May, Monday. I welcome you all on the behalf of Study IQIS English. My name is Pritish Mathurka. I welcome and I extend my warmest regards to those of you who are watching me for the first time today and also to those who are continually watching me. So, this session is being conducted especially for you all. This series is being conducted especially for you all so that you can have an in-depth uh, exemplary analysis of Hindu newspaper which you can directly apply in your prelims as well as your mains. So I as your primary faculty will be focusing primarily on three things now. The first thing being detailed analysis of the present day Hindu. So I will be doing that predominantly in a PDF format and all of these PDFs will be readily available to you the moment this session ends. After the analysis, I will try to paint the utilitarian value of these PDFs of this current affairs, which you can directly apply in your prelims as well as your mains. So considering the utilitarian value of this topic, so I intend to cover roughly 30 to 40 marks in your prelims and approximately 200 to 300 marks in your mains. And if essay comes in our purview, if GS paper 3 becomes more current affairs based, then we can extend it up to 400 to 500 marks too. And the second thing which I want to discuss with you or which I tend to do while doing the analysis is focusing on answer writing, focusing on vocabulary and focusing on structuring. So these three parameters also I tend to improve with each and every one of you. And the third and the most important thing with regards to this is that now we will be focusing more and more on interlinkage because now a considerable time has gone up. So now it's time that we start interlinking the current affairs and majority of the articles today will be from that perspective wherein I tend to interlink all the different aspects which we have done up till now. Good morning Aditi. Good morning to everyone those who are watching me. So as promised, each session will begin with a famous quote by a famous personality. So this being the start of the week, this being a fresh start of the week, Monday, so which more entitled personality than one of the most enlightening, one of the most spiritual and one of the most well accomplished personality in the world than Swami Vivekananda ji. So the quote which you are seeing on the back of my head, rather dare I say on the digital flat panel is given by Swami Vivekananda ji and the quote is arise awake and stop not till your goal is rich. So with each sunrise you should say this quote. You should imbibe your coat in the bloodstream. Good morning, Anu. Why? Because each morning will be a different sunrise for you. Okay. Each morning will open up new avenues for you. You shouldn't wake up the way you slept. Each morning should give you a new way, a new perspective, a new outlook of waking up. So as you arise, as you wake up, you have to see that you are not stopping until your goal is reached. Okay, the goal can be a daily basis, the goal can be a monthly basis, the goal can be a quarterly basis, semi yearly basis, or full yearly basis, or it can be a lifetime goal. So, defining goals, setting up goals is your trajectory, but make sure that each day you are waking up different, each day you are toiling hard till when? Till your goal is not reached. So like each day my ulti my primary goal or dare I say ultimate goal is with you all is that I want that I should cover up the current affairs in a most holistic way. So that's my primary goal as of now. So that is what I intend to do every morning as I wake up as I rise I do the analysis for you all. Okay. So similar thing you should do also and as I already told I will not be using the word hope anymore. I will be using faith. So I have faith in each and every one of you. And I hope that you also have faith. See, again, I have used the word hope. But why? <laughs> because now I have to say that you have faith in me too. So I have faith that you also have faith in me and that you and me are moving ahead in this journey together. Okay. So let's start discussing today's article, guys. So in each class, I tend to paint a severity score of the articles wherein you can utilize that severity score for application in prelims as well as mains. So today's severity score is between 4 to 6 of every article. Okay. 
none of the articles is not that highly important but some of the articles are little bit important from prelims perspective okay so today is the first session in this series that where i will be focusing more on the prelims aspect because you have certain breakthroughs in the field of science and tech you have certain explainer with regards to the properties of millets so which i think are important from prelims perspective as well as mains but today majority of the articles will be the headline based articles and which will have direct applicability in prelims so in short i'm painting severity score of 4 to 6 so today i will be discussing the analysis of hindu of yesterday that is 14th of may sunday and also today so two days of paper i will be clinching in roughly one half to one and a half hour okay so let's start our journey welcome aboard everyone those who are watching me so the first article today is with regards to the exploitation of groundwater and how does it affect the local geology and the local hydrology so groundwater exploitation is silently sinking the ground beneath India's feet. Okay, so this article becomes very important from the over exploitation of groundwater perspective and with resource management. Guys, resource management is now an increasingly unknown territory which UPSC is now tapping into. Okay, three, four years back resource management was not that evident in civil services examination but now as more and more debate is coming as more and more ill effects of the unplanned development are coming forth so upsc is slowly slowly tapping into resource management too so resource management is now important from gs perspective especially with regards to gs paper 1 and gs paper 3 and those of you who have geography as their optional resource management is a separate topic so this article will also be very important from that perspective too okay so let's start reading what do you mean by this okay Cracks building, cracks in building, sinking land in Joshimut. You all know what happened in Joshimut, a hill town in Uttarakhand made national headlines earlier this year. So because of unplanned development, because of construction of tunnels, basically the soil layers beneath the Joshimut, they basically sank. So you had subsidence of soil resulting into localized cracks, localized downhill of land in Joshimut. Now similar thing is happening in the GR belt of India, in the green revolution belt of India. A similar phenomenon has been playing out for years in the plains of Punjab, Haryana, Delhi and Faridabad. This unlikely culprit is excessive groundwater extraction. Okay, so Punjab, Haryana, Delhi and Faridabad. Okay, now you know that majority of the northern india or dare i say majority of the agriculture in india is dependent on groundwater as its primary irrigation source okay we don't have proper centralized irrigation mechanisms neither do we have irri efficient irrigation deployment like drip irrigation like sprinkler irrigation okay nowadays you also have micro drip irrigation so majority of indian farmers are dependent on groundwater as their primary irrigation source so, as they are dependent on groundwater, the groundwater extraction potential is very high in India. Okay, what do you mean by groundwater extraction and what do you mean by groundwater extraction potential? So, let us assume that in a year, India receives A amount of rainfall and out of that A amount, let's say B amount of rainfall is getting recharged in the groundwater. But is the entire B amount of rainfall available for extraction? No, you can extract a little part of B. So, how much part of B you can extract to be utilized in agriculture that is called as groundwater extraction potential. And what is groundwater extraction efficiency? That how much of the available resource you can actually utilize for your irrigation, for your drinking purposes with present day technology. So in India, both groundwater extraction is very very high and the efficiency is almost now reaching up to 70 80 90 percent so almost 70 to 80 percent of your groundwater reservoirs are now being utilized for agriculture for domestic use and also dare i say for industrial uses so now they are on the verge of being over exploited majority of them are already being over exploited those which were not tapped before now they are also on the verge of being over exploited so please keep this in mind good morning jagriti okay <clears throat> agricultural practices in the northwest india are heavily dependent on groundwater withdrawal all you know this with limited monsoon rain groundwater table is 
precariously low so data gathered for years by the central ground water board okay so you all know that india's agriculture is at the whim of the rain god and hence we have to depend on the ground water but if the ground water is not being recharged then what will happen the recharge is less your uses is increasing so because of that extraction is increasing as extraction is increasing extraction is slowly converting into exploitation a very similar analogy i will paint with regards to you all so that you remember this groundwater debate now just imagine i am asking you to exercise okay i am asking you to exercise the first hour of your wake up like if you are waking up let's say at 7 am you have slept for good 8 hours and you are waking up at 7 am and i am asking you to do exercise in the first hour of your wake up so let's say i am asking you to do exercise at 7:45 your energy will be very high you will do good exercise but now just imagine that instead of doing exercise at 7:45 am i am asking you to do exercise at 7:45 pm what will happen your exercise will turn into exertion why because your energy has now dwindled so already your energy has dwindled and now you are over exerting your body so exercise will become exertion so the same thing is happening with ground water reservoir as in india too what is happening already the recharge is less because of the whims of the monsoon and as more and more of india is dependent on ground water extraction for agriculture uses for domestic uses and also for industrial uses its exploitation is now increasing so just keep this in mind okay in punjab for instance 76% of ground water blocks are over exploited just imagine this 76% close to 80% of ground water blocks in punjab are over exploited in chandigarh it is 64% and about 50% in delhi delhi you know like it's all in a like delhi is on the verge of becoming necropolis why because of resource constraints this means that more ground water than can be recharged is extracted this is the crux of this article okay how much of ground water is being recharged we are moving ahead of that in terms of exploitation so your recharge is less but your usage is more so it is resulting into over exploitation so already in the evening time your energy has drained but now you are demanding more energy in terms of physical exercise so your body is going to get over exploited your body is going to get overused same thing is happening with ground water okay over time when the underlying aquifers deep water channels that are stores of percolated water aren't recharged they run dry so the underwater aquifers definitely will run dry and layers of soil and rock above them start to sink so if you are having this aquifer within the layers of the earth now this aquifer is running dry what will happen you will have gradual sinking of the soil and rocks above so because of this you will have land subsidence okay what has been found in india operations that are carried out hundreds of meters below the ground for coal oil gas through the years had shown examples of soil settlement or soil sinking to fill voids created from mining so it has been found globally and in india that whenever you are doing sand mining whenever you are doing mining of coal for oil for gas so what has it resulted into soil settlement wherein the soil settles into the new gaps form wherein the soil settles into the new voids form so you have to equate ground water extraction with what with soil settlement so please remember you have to interlink ground water extraction with what with soil settlement this is the crux okay you have to equate the groundwater extraction with soil settlement okay <clears throat> so now let us consider the central groundwater board okay now what is the lacuna of central groundwater board that central groundwater board has basically erected groundwater monitoring stations they have basically erected sensors for monitoring how much of the groundwater is being recharged okay how much of groundwater is actually available but what data do they lack they lack the data of ever exploitation that how much exactly the water is going over exploited so you have to just remember this one line from the lacuna of monitoring 
What is that? It has a system of groundwater observation wells and monitoring water levels four times a year. It, however, does not analyze the consequences of over exploitation. So this is the lacuna of CBWG that it cannot analyze the consequences of over exploitation. So in this article, guys, you have to remember three things. Number first, that over the years, the groundwater extraction of India is increasing. In the GR belt, in the Green Revolution belt of India, the groundwater extraction is now close to 80%. Because of this, what is happening? The aquifers which are running dry, now the soil is trying to settle inside. So you are having soil settlement. So groundwater extraction, you are interacting, you are interlinking it with soil settlement. So first interlinkage of this article. Second, what data do we have? We have data on monitoring the wells. We have data on monitoring how much of groundwater is being recharged. But we don't have data on the consequences of over exploitation. So these three things, what is the groundwater extraction? It's interlinked with soil settlement and what data we are lacking. So this three data you will have to quote from this article whenever you have question with regards to maintenance, with regards to resource management, with regards to the management of groundwater reservoirs in India. Okay. So this is a wholesome article, not wholesome per se, but a good article wherein you can write one to one and a half pages of your answer. So this was one of the opening articles of today. The second article is a very kind of innovative article, innovative in the sense that uh, you will enjoy reading this. So sometimes these articles are very important from the challenges to India's security perspective because India's security does not mean only the threats from criminal organizations, only the threats from terrorist organizations, but it also means that you are protecting the well-being, you are protecting the health of the Indian citizens too. So if there is a challenge on the health front, then such kind of articles become very handy. Okay. Now, why this article is so goddamn important? Because the largest ever seizure of drugs has been reported okay the largest ever seizure means roughly 1500 crores of drugs have been seized okay and from where are these drugs coming but naturally from the makaran coast okay so all of these drugs are basically made or manufactured or grown in afghanistan they are routed to central india from afghanistan from afghanistan they reach to the shores of southern pakistan and iran and from where they reach to india I will also open up the map and showcase you how this is done. So basically, why this becomes important because of two things. Number first, it is the biggest ever seizement. It is the biggest ever catch. It is the biggest ever seizure of the drugs reported by the Indian authorities, roughly 1500 crores. And for the first time, the mothership of the drug cartel has been seized. Uh, those of you are listening me now, Aditi, Anup and Jagriti and the other people, please understand this. This is the first burst. This is the first seizure of mothership. What do you mean by mothership? So normally how do drug cartels operate? So they tend to load a drug on a big ship. So when the big ship reaches to the shorelines of India, you will have small, small boats coming and joining the big ship from where the drugs are offloaded onto small ferries onto small boats and these boats then distribute the drugs pan india along the coastline so up till now we didn't seize a big mothership but for the first time a mothership has been seized in the drug bust so it's a big win for the law enforcement agencies of india and it's a big win for india with regards to the threat perception on the health front of india hence this news becomes important so you can utilize this as a case study in your ethics paper, as a case study in GS paper 3 and also like if any one of you is interested in police services and if the interview panel asks you like highlight some of the recent um, achievements in the threat security perception of India so you can directly quote this article. So let's do that. Okay, headline news don't need to worry with regards to details. Details I have already mentioned you. Okay, NCB and Navy make the biggest seizure of drugs in India. NCB and CB make the biggest drug seizure in India. In what is claimed to be the biggest ever drug seizure in terms of monetary value by any anti-drug enforcement agency in the country. 
the narcotics control bureau ncb and the indian navy in a joint operation of kerala coast have seized around 2500 kg of methamphetamine valued at around 1500 crore originating from pakistan okay so already you know what is happening in pakistan okay people are pelting stones and you are having drugs export from pakistan so see the two sides of the same coin okay it uh, you are not getting wheat to it you are not getting rice to it you don't have anything to eat but still they will do drug smuggling okay so we don't know where it goes okay it is also the first interception of a mother ship carrying drugs by a indian agency and a man suspected of pakistani origin has been detained from the ship the caesar now this is important from pulim's perspective the caesar is a part of operation samudra gupt prelims important guys this caesar is a part of what which operation operation samudra gupt prelims targeting maritime trafficking of drugs aimed at making the indian ocean region free of narcotics so which is the operation which is being carried out to make the indian ocean region drug free to be devoid of any narcotic smuggling it is operation samudra gupt and for the first time in this operation we have captured a mother ship originating from we don't know what country should be called pakistan now but originating from our dear neighbor okay <clears throat> the drug had its origin in pakistan and was loaded into the mother ship from the makaran coast so if i want to showcase you what is the makaran coast so i am opening up the atlas for you all so just understand where is the makaran coast and how it is smuggled into india <clears throat> okay so this is india okay the coast which i am marking on your atlas okay this complete coastline this complete coastline from the east of strait of humrus till india this complete coastline this is called as makaran coast this is called as makaran coast okay okay to the north of makaran coast you all have hilly territory okay you all know afghanistan is the uh, backyard for poppy cultivation marijuana cultivation and from central asia the drugs are smuggled from everywhere the drugs are smuggled into this part of the world and from there they are loaded onto ships from over here and then the ships take off distributing drugs in kerala in bay of bengal it further goes into southeast asia so this is the makaran coast southern coast of iran and southern coast of pakistan so the chabahar port the gadwar port the port of karachi they all are on the makaran coast okay so if anybody asks you like which river drains into this so your one shot answer must be indus so it is basically the delta of the indus okay so this is the makaran coast so you need to remember this article from two perspectives the first perspective being that this is the largest ever drug seizure and it has originated from makaran coast and for the first time mother ship has been intercepted okay the modulus operandi is to halt the mother ship at a particular point at which the crew in the ship perceives a message about the boat to which the drug is to be offloaded so this is how the drug cartels normally operate so they receive a message on wireless that please stop your mother ship there now we are sending boats from the coast you can offload your drugs to those boats and those boats will distribute the drugs further hinterland so this operation becomes very very important and what is the name of the bigger operation it is operation samudra gupt okay so this was the second article which was important from today's perspective let's do the another article guys very very innovative article very very encouraging news and you should take down such articles you should take down such news for quoting directly in your gs paper 4 that is ethics mind you guys ethics paper is 200% i am not saying 100% it is 200% incomplete without quoting examples ravi you are saying jai hind sir yes of course it's jai hind like if indian navy and ncb are cashing such a huge amount so kudos to the security forces of india and whatever may be the communal tensions in india whatever may be the uh, tensions with regards to social harmony of india i and you we all know that as indians we are all together so jai hind okay 
so such examples or such case studies become very important for you quoting in ethics so it's my humble request that i told each and every one of you to maintain a separate diary for example so you can add up this as an example in your diary why because for the first time an entire ward of a village has become beneficiary to a insurance so for the first time all the members of the ward are getting free of cost insurance and you know guys post covid insurance is very very necessary because you don't know at what time you will face a tragedy in life at what time you can incur loss of life of your dear family members so you should have some insurance ready with you so you can quote this article as case study okay so <clears throat> kalangumakal is a non descript ruler pocket in kollam district of kerala kalangumka mostly populated by the underprivileged families but now it will be the state's first fully insured ward as its 1382 recipients in the 5 to 70 age group have been provided insurance coverage against accidental death and disability so for the first time all of its residents have been given insurance with regards to accidental death and disability okay and you can remember the name of this person you can directly quote this in your ethics paper for following the initiative of the ward councillor g jay prakash the entire ward now has an insurance coverage of over 13.82 crore under a plan provided by united india assurance a public sector company all permanent and temporary residents of the ward have been offered the financial safety net of insurance coverage so all permanent as well as temporary okay so you can quote the name of this person g jay prakash who is he? he is the ward councillor and how much of insurance has been provided collectively approximately 13.82 crore 14 crore and which is the company united india insurance okay it's a public sector company and both permanent as well as temporary residents have been covered by the insurance scheme so a very welcome news and such kind of efforts do paint a picture that yes there is still goodwill in the society not everyone functions for his or her own profits there are some good people in the society who think about the greater good of the society as a whole who think that their community should move ahead with the utmost safety that whatever happens in life we have to keep a smile on our face and march ahead okay so that is what you all should do when you become civil servant guys it will be your humble duty that to ensure or to bolster such kind of attitude amongst the people okay so let's move ahead i told you guys that majority of the articles today will be headline based articles hence i'm just plainly blustering through now this article is very important again from prelims perspective but also from the deplorable conditions of the police workers in the ncity of india okay national capital territory so in this one article uh, we will try to understand what issues the lower most ranks of the police forces face and what are the recommendations with regards to the administrative reforms commission the fifth report and what needs to be done on the ground to ensure the ethical way of conduct between the senior officers and the lower officers so now those of you who are aiming for ips uh, any one of you who are watching me live anybody aiming for ips ravi jagriti anup aditi you are free to comment so if any one of you are aiming for ips you need to understand this very very fundamentally what is this that whenever you have a crime being conducted whenever you have a crime scene the first person to report are the police constables the police constables are the first line of interaction between the public and the police and police constables are stretched off the limits in their working hours okay now if i paint you the case study what is happening in ncit so in ncit police officers work for 24 to 36 hours at a stretch just imagine this they work for 24 to 36 hours at a stretch and the senior officers they don't even listen to their arduous nature they don't even take care or they take cognizance of their health problems they just say that you have have to report to work so there is basically disharmony with the senior management of the police service and the lower most management of the police service okay and these people they are the first one to report at any crime scene the senior officers they don't come you can't expect the sp you can't expect the cp acp dcp to report 
at the first crime scene they only come when the crime is of very big scale you have numerous people involved you have different agencies involved then the senior officers are being called into but the first line of interaction are our poor constables so it's not that you need to get this article only from the deplorable conditions perspective but you also need to understand the ethical perspective behind this and that our police forces are severely stretched you may take a holiday on new year's eve you may take a holiday on independence day but the police forces no they are not entitled to leave they work for our safety 24/7 so it's our duty as an informed citizen it will be your duty as the future police implementers that to do something to improve their conditions okay so let's move ahead <clears throat> the miserable living and working conditions of the constabulary in the delhi police have been highlighted in many reports but not much has been done to address the problems and the prejudices faced by them okay incidentally even the focus of police reforms introduced through judicial interventions has been on high ranking officers rather than the constabulary so even though you have police reforms being enforced by the judiciary but all of these reforms are pertaining to only the high ranking officers they don't consider the lower ranking officers they don't consider the fourth kind of defense of the police that is the constable okay in 2015 the head constable babu lal mithraval challenged the provisions of the section 22 of the police act 1861 he con tended that utilizing the shield of this statutory provisions which state that the police officer shall be assumed to be on duty for 24 hours of the day so according to the section 22 of police act 1861 it is assumed that the police officers to be on duty for 24 hours a day the delhi police was assigning duties of over 36 hours at a stretch to its personnel so this is basically very inhuman guys okay so you are taking undue advantage of the law okay please get my word very properly it is basically the undue advantage of the law okay so what is happening over here is that you are getting a statutory provision wherein you are stretching the officers to their full extent and you are also extending their stretch and this is happening why because you are getting undue advantage or you are basically using the act in a maleficent way you are not using that act in a properly oriented way as the work should needs to be done see according to act it's the duty of police officers to be present 24 hours a day 24 hours a day means what you don't know when the law and order situation will deteriorate you don't know whenever an emergency will come so what is mentioned in the act is in the face of danger that you as a police officer you should be reporting on duty whenever circumstances warrant but this does not mean that the senior management basically gives them duty basically gives them work shifts which stretch for more than a day so it is basically undue advantage of the law okay after 30 hearings just listen to this after 30 hearings spanning 8 years the high court recently ordered the delhi police commissioner to constitute a specialized committee if required to examine mr mr suggestions for streamlining the working conditions of the constable so after 30 hearings he is finally getting some justice so again a very sad state of affairs okay now you need to remember this in entirety okay the fifth report of the second administrative reforms commission 2007 okay you will be studying administrative reforms commission report in gs paper 2 in detail in the governance part so for now just remember this paragraph observed that the performance of police personnel is linked to their morale what did this fifth report of the second administrative commission report say that the performance of the police personnel is linked to their morale which is linked to the environment and the service conditions long working hours tough working conditions the mechanical nature of the job inadequate welfare measures and insufficient housing mean that the police officers are constantly under pressure sapping their morale and motivation okay guys let me just again up example paint example with regards to your understanding of this okay now 
यू आर ऑल डेली वॉचिंग मी ऑन यूट्यूब लाइफ फॉर एनालिसिस ऑफ करंट अफेयर्स वाई आर यू वॉचिंग दिस ओके फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई एम गुड सो दैट्स वाई आई होप दैट यू आर वॉचिंग मी बट वॉट्स द एग्जैक्ट रीजन दैट यू आर वॉचिंग दिस बिकॉज यू फेल्ट दैट यू आर समवेयर लैकिंग इन द एनालिसिस ऑफ हिंदू यू फेल्ट दैट अवर कवरेज ऑफ हिंदू वॉज नॉट बींग डन in the most appropriate way and that whenever you refer to some other discussion some other analysis you felt left out why because the environment was not that conducive the environment was not that good in you grasping the analysis so that is why you are sticking with me in this environment why because i am basically enabling you all i am lowering my level to your level slowly 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 we are increasing both of our level so i am creating a enabling working environment for you all so that you and me both get in consonance you slowly improve upon your level and then i try introducing the higher level aspects so this is what is needed in the police services too if you don't have proper working conditions if you don't have proper enabling environment how do you expect that the first line of interaction between the public and the law agencies will function to their maximum extent so it becomes a question of ethical dilemma to that whether it is expected of the police functionary it is expected of the constabulary to be in their 100% 24 hours a day so no this is not done this is not a ethical dimension wherein you are tapping for them to work 24 hours a day even stretch their work limit to 36 hours a day and still expect them to function in the same manner to function with their full potential to function with their full energy for 36 hours no okay observe that the performance and the police personnel is linked to their moral which is linked to the environment service conditions long working hours tough working conditions the mechanical nature of their job they have to sit in their vans and they have to do patrolling they have to report to every goddamn crime scene inadequate welfare measures and insufficient housing mean that the police officers are constantly under pressure sapping their moral and motivation okay the fifth report of the second administrative reforms commission noted that 87% of all police personnel are constables and termed them the cutting edge functionaries of the police so roughly 87% of all the police personnel is basically the constabulary and it has, they have been referred to as what the cutting edge functionaries of the police because they are the first person to report okay who are usually the first interface of the police with the public who are the first interface of the police with the public and you are stretching them to their extent you are stretching them to the brim so this is not done it is highlighted that the unsatisfactory living and working conditions and demeaning manner in which the constables are often treated by their superiors it is therefore not surprising that the self respect morale and confidence with which they start their career get eroded in a way in a very short time so you are working environment is not good you are not enabling everything for them they have to report every time then you have to stretch them you are stretching them stretching them means giving them long working shifts and most importantly they are being demeaned they are being not supported by the senior management so how come they, you expect their morale to be high how come you expect their josh to be high every time so guys this is one of the most deplorable article with regards to the constabulary of indian police force and you need to understand they constitute how much more than 80% and they are the first interaction or the first line of interaction of the police and the public they are called as the what they are called as the cutting edge functionaries of the police and usually the first interface of police with the public so please remember this terminologies please quote them in your answers if you have any answer on police reforms what is needed how it needs to be done and what is the report fifth report of administrative reforms commission on 7 so all of this you can highlight in your answers okay so this was again a headline based article which has both utility in prelims as well as mains now let's do the other article <clears throat> again guys now this is a headline based article which you can use in your 
GS paper 3 as a case study in GS paper 4 and also in prelims. So, this is basically a success story of Agra from medieval structures to modern systems. So, you all know that you had a mission called a Smart Cities Mission which was started by this government to basically convert the cities who were under the ages of this program into smart cities wherein you will have modern day urban infrastructure wherein you will have digital governance as the sole modulus operandi of governing those areas and you will have deployment of what you will have deployment of cutting edge technology for doing this so now agra has become the second city in india to become fully smart but there is a small catch in this that catch i will explain you in the last of this article so you now need to remember that we are doing a case study of agra now which is the second city in india to become a smart city and it has utilized this smart infrastructure to its full potential so let us understand what do you mean by this and let us understand how artificial intelligence is helping in digital governance okay potholes traffic rule violations even sexual harassment all this can be detected by the system employed by the agra smart city spread over an area of 2250 acres this area is now being monitored 24 7 by integrated command and control center so you can monitor potholes you can monitor traffic rule violations you can monitor even sexual harassment basically you can monitor everything okay so if you have stray dog menace so you have now increasing cases where stray dogs are biting people so using ai you can also detect stray dogs that whether the stray dogs are roaming freely or not and you can send the officers over there to catch them using ai you can scan the faces of the people whether the people are wearing helmet while they're riding on the scooters or not and you can issue challenge to them okay and which is the command center it is called as the integrated command and control center set up eight months ago the central room manned by 24 7 by specially trained employees has large number of visuals zooming in okay AI powered. There are live updates of clogged manholes, waste collection from the houses of the 2.5 lakh population and vehicles illegally parked. So there are live updates of what clogged manholes, waste collection from the houses and vehicles illegally parked. AI is enabled with identification protocols for detection of all of this and more. Okay, so basically using artificial intelligence, we are now detecting irregularities in the best management, we are detecting irregularities with regards to pothole management and we are also detecting irregularities with regards to the unadherence of the law. So you are driving and you saw a parking space which is vacant, so you quickly went and parked. See that is what happens in India, na? what happens that as soon as you see a little space you try to cringe in as much vehicles as possible but is that parking space legal or illegal who understand this no one so now using ai we will monitor this we will try to improve what management see guys it's not that we are using this technology basically to punish the people no please don't get into this argument the argument is that in india what do we lack primarily we lack management okay the same thing which is happening with you all now you are all in your early stages of preparation some of you might be in the advanced stages of preparation but still majority of you lack management so that is where i am coming in handy that i am basically managing hindu for you all so you just doing this whatever i am telling you will take care of your current affairs analysis up to 80 percent so the same thing we are doing now in the smart cities we are basically advocating for what we are basically advocating for management and for doing management we are resorting to digital governance okay <clears throat> when the camera catches a person on two wheeler riding without a helmet for instance a red circle appears on the screen and this information is automatically sent to the police so how the artificial intelligence and how the ICCC functions on the ground the ICCC also controls the smart transport system, adaptive traffic control light and environment sensors. AI adjusts the duration of traffic lights during peak hours depending on the vehicular flow on a particular stretch. So if you are having 
peak working hours peak working hours means whenever you will have closure of officers offices or opening up of offices so you must have seen long queues on the traffic signals so ai will analyze that like if from one particular sector heavy traffic is incoming so for that particular sector the stopping times on the traffic signal will be amended appropriately considering how much traffic is coming so this is the main function in how ai is being utilized the ieccc also controls the smart transport system adaptive traffic light control and environment sensors ai adjusts the duration of traffic lights during peak hours depending on the vehicular flow of a particular stretch the ieccc also has plans to integrate monitoring and control of parking street lighting water meters and grievances management too so you can also file a complaint you can also address your grievances using this so ieccc also has plan to integrate monitoring control of parking street lighting water meters and grievances management okay agra is one of the 22 cities which have been able to complete all projects under the smart city mission and agra is the second city after surat to be able to meet all project deadlines so after surat agra is the second city to meet all of its project deadlines so it is one of the 22 cities which is now going smart but after surat agra is the second important city in india which has met all of its project deadlines so a big smile on everyone's face that finally in india the cities are now turning smart and you all know agra you have taj mahal many many tourists flock there not only local tourists but international tourists so it's uh, now a moral duty dare i say a ethical duty to do this okay but the catch everything will have some negative aspects it's just like life not everything is positive there has to be something negative so the catch however is that the development work has been carried out in 225 acres of land which includes areas around taj mahal and taj ganj agra fort and its vicinity and fatehabad road creating an oasis of sorts in the urban space the rest of the city can choose to replicate this model or choose its own method of deployment so only the area around taj mahal and taj ganj has been made smart rest of the city is now left out so it has created what it has created an oasis of sorts of the urban space so in the city of agra you have a oasis in that oasis only everything is smart outside that oasis nothing is smart so this mission needs to be replicated across the entire space of the city across the entire urban landscape so rapid expansion of this program is very very essential okay so you don't need to create such oasis in every goddamn city of india that only the most important parts of the city are smart rest of the city is not smart no this is not done so you will have to invest in the rapid expansion of this program okay so this article again was very important from headlines perspective that after surat agra is now the second city in india to meet all of its deadlines and agra is now using ai to manage the city to do digital governance so from managing potholes to monitoring streets to monitoring illegal parking to seeing whether people are wearing helmets to see whether do you have street dog menace to see whether you are having proper solid waste management so for all of this ai is being utilized so you can have a one liner question in prelims that what what does the i triple c of agra command so you can have one two three four options you can have the same question in mains that how ai is being utilized for resource management in india highlight with examples or highlight the success of smart cities mission in india with its challenges so you can have such type of question is main wherein you can utilize such kind of articles okay. so now let's move towards the most important article of today <clears throat> okay and this article guys is very very important so please focus on the board very properly okay uh, sometimes the session gets too long why because i have to discuss the current affairs of two days so i know that some of you might be wondering that why this session is getting too long but just bear with me after this we just have one more article to discuss okay and both of these articles are the most important articles of today so please bear with me uh, anup uh, ravi jagriti and aditi i hope you are all following the way i am going today both prelims important and mains important but more emphasis on the prelims okay so the nutritional value of minutes this is today's explainer 
Why it becomes important now? Because 2023 is the international year of millets. Before moving ahead, I am just highlighting you three or four points which are very important with regards to millets. Okay. Number first, we are all living in the era of climate change. Hence, climate resilient agriculture. Climate resilient agriculture. Okay. Resilient agriculture is very important from India's perspective. Okay. What do you mean by climate resilient agriculture? CRA. Okay. We have to acknowledge that climate change has already happened. So, we require certain crops. We require those crops which can thrive, which can survive in the situations of floods, which can, situation, which can survive in the situation of long droughts. So, the crops need to be resilient to climatic stress. That is the one word definition of climate line, climate resilient agriculture. Which agriculture practice you are going to dominate? Climate resilient agriculture. In climate resilient agriculture, what you intend to achieve or what is your modulus operandi? That we will cultivate those crops. We will grow those crops which can sustain climatic stress. So, climatic stress will link to be climatic resilient agriculture. Number two. Number two. Millets are very important from nutritional perspective. Okay. They are very important from nutritional perspective. Why they are so damn important? We will study in this article. Okay. Now, with regards to nutritional perspective, you need to understand there are three types of nutritional deficiencies or there are three types of hunger issues in India. Okay. So, basically, with regards to nutrition, okay. With regards to food security, you have malnutrition. Malnutrition can either be undernutrition or overnutrition. What you find in the rural areas is undernutrition, wherein you are having wasting, wherein you are having stunting. In urban areas, where you have the privilege of eating Domino's pizza, where you have the privilege of eating pasta, burgers, McDonald's, KFC, where you have the privilege of drinking sugary drinks. Okay, so there you will have overnutrition. So, malnutrition will cover overnutrition and undernutrition. The second important type of hunger that you have in India, it is called as protein energy malnourishment. I am again reiterating, you have the second type of hunger is protein energy malnourishment, where dare I say more than 95% of population of India, including me, including you all, I am including myself. We don't eat the requisite amount of protein that is required for our bodily functions on a daily basis. So, 95% of India suffers from PEM. It is called as protein energy malnourishment. So, nutrition you have of number one, you have overnutrition or you have undernutrition. So, it will both of them will be termed under malnutrition. The second type of hunger issue that we face is protein energy malnourishment. And the third and the most daunting kind of hunger that you have in India, hunger issue that you have in India, it is called as hidden hunger. It is called as what? It is called as hidden hunger. Okay. What do you mean by hidden hunger? Hidden hunger is basically the deficiency of vitamins and minerals. So, vitamins, basically the vital amine, NH group and minerals, copper, zinc, magnesium, which are very important for your cellular functioning of the body. So, at the cellular level, vitamins and minerals, they act as transporters, they act as carriers of nutrients. So, in India, nutrition will include three parameters, malnutrition, protein energy malnourishment and lastly, hidden hunger. So, you need to remember nutrition from these three perspectives. And third, the most important issue in this article is processing. You all know that you all eat white rice, but is white rice the natural way of eating? No, ideally you should eat brown rice, but you are basically doing what? You are basically polishing the rice. So, in polishing the rice, some of it, its nutritional value is decreasing. So, in this article, we will first understand why, why millets are so goddamn important. Why? Because they are climate resilient. Number two, how do they intend to survive on the nutritional level basis of India? And how can they contribute to nutritional security of India? And number three, the most challenging issue they are pegged with today, that is overprocessing. 
that is polishing so this three to four terminologies we'll discuss in this article and mind you guys this being the international year of millets so it is very important that you understand this issue okay so why are millets popular sources of nutrition what are the different parts of millet kernel how are nutrients in the millets affected by processing and polishing can millets thrive in harsh resource poor conditions so this is what we need to understand okay so let's start with the discussion the story so far okay the un food agriculture organization has declared 2023 to be the international year of millets giving these crops a shot in the arm even as the countries worldwide are looking into them for their ability to grow in environmental conditions that climate crisis is rendering more commonly okay millets require low input requirements and high nutritional density both of which are valuable for a country whose food security is expected to face significant challenges in the coming decades so what do millets have millets have low input requirement input requirements means what they will not require that much amount of water they will not require fertilizers they will not require proper field management as compared to wheat rice and other water guzzling crops that we have in india and they, they are low input requirement and additionally they also have good nutritional density so both of these things are very conducive for agriculture in india in coming decades why because all of us are now going to face the brunt of climate change and agriculture is not evading from that so if you are cultivating a crop which is low on the input side but high on the output side output side means that you are getting a bumper crop and also you are ensuring the nutritional safety of india why not advocate for such kind of crops okay however the consumption of millets face one threat that has already overtaken india's major food crops that is grain processing so the threat is that millets which the threat which are millets facing today it is basically grain processing okay so what are millets millets are fundamentally grasses so if anyone asks you sir madam what are millets so millets are nothing but fundamentally grasses they are cultivated worldwide but especially in the tropical areas of africa and asia as cereal crops so they are fundamentally grasses they are cultivated especially in the areas of the tropical part of africa and asia as cereal crops okay some of the examples of millets okay so if i'm painting you some of the examples of millet you have pearl millet pearl millet means bajra you must have written roti of bajra then you have barnyard millet barnyard millet is called as sanaba then you have finger millet finger millet is ragi and then you have foxtail millet it is called as kangani okay so different millets you can cook them as a rice preparation you can cook them in roti making you can use them as light snack whenever you want to so this three four are the different examples of millets that are primarily grown in india there is both paleontological and textual evidence to indicate that millets being cultivated in indian subcontinent 5 millennia ago so millet cultivation in india goes back millennia ago according to the agriculture and processed food development authority india is the world's largest producer of millets so india ranks number 1 in producing millets and in india millet cultivation goes back 5 millennia ago okay and why are the millets sought after what is so damn positive with regards to millets okay millets have broad features that render them attractive their nutritional value comparable to that of the major extant food crops and better on some counts so if you consider millets with the food grains like wheat rice so they have good nutritional content and their ability to reliably withstand harsh resource poor conditions so they can withstand harsh resource poor conditions very very easily so that is why they are most sought after okay they are drought tolerant adapted to growing in warm weather and require low moisture they are particularly efficient consumers of water and loamy soil so they are drought tolerant number first they are adapted to growing in warm weather so all of you know india does face drought yes india does face drought and now you also have what you also have el nino looming on india 
so but naturally this year monsoons are not going to be that good so we are now facing drought conditions in the near future so millets number one they are drought tolerant they are adapted to growing in which conditions warm conditions india being a subtropical country but because of himalayas we don't have the cold winds from siberia reaching into india hence india's climate is roughly warm largely warm so they are adapted to growing in warm conditions hence they are also suited for india and they require low moisture okay anitoxomally they are particularly efficient consumers of water so even if you give them little amount of water they can consume it very very efficiently and largely they also require loamy soil so loamy soil is basically that soil which normally you find in the water stress regions of india so all of these four parameters are exclusively met by the indian agricultural condition hence millets are the go to crop if you want to achieve food security in india why because they are low on the input side and they are very high on the nutritional side so hence international year of millets is very very important from india uh, someone is saying repeat please you will be elaborate i will repeat the concept again okay nothing less millets have upper hand over crops like rice and maize with more drought like conditions expected in many parts of the world including newly realized prospects of flash droughts that being said millets don't harbor better growing conditions and respond positively to high moisture and nutrient content in the soil you need to understand this that nutrients wise millets are very good but as they are low on the input side it does not mean that they can grow in soils which are heavily saturated with fertilizers you you might say that sir as they require low input requirements as they require very low amount of fertilizers so what we will do in order to increase the yield in order to increase the productivity let us supply soils with more fertilizers let us supply soils with more nutrients but mind you millets cannot survive in very high nutrient rich soil so this is a catch can millets survive drought conditions yes they can survive drought conditions can millets survive warm weather yes they can survive warm weather can millets survive water stress yes can millets grow in loamy soil yes but can millets grow in heavily nutrient rich soil no can they survive very extreme flash floods no so if you supply them with over nutrients if you supply them with over the top conditions they cannot survive so this is a catch and hence the dryland agriculture belt of india becomes the first area where you should advocate for millet cultivation like madhya pradesh chatisgarh then you have uh, southern up you have jharkhand you have eastern gujarat eastern rajasthan so all of these areas which are facing dry which are facing warm weather which have drought conditions like vidarbha telangana so there you can advocate for cultivation of millets per se in india okay according to ms swaminathan research foundation millets also thrive on marginal land in upland and hilly regions marginal land is a land whose rent is higher than the value of crops that can be cultivated there so marginal land is basically like if you are going on a hill top if you are going on a slope so there you have to to do counter bunding counter bunding basically to stop the water flow you have to see whether the nutrients in the soils are properly leached leached in the sense that whenever you are supplying nutrients the nutrients should go into the lower layers of the soil so in hill areas the rent of the soil or the operation cost of maintaining the land itself is higher than that of the crops but these crops can also survive on the hilly areas and on the marginal land so you can also advocate for millet cultivation in the hilly areas of india too so not only the dryland agricultural belt of india is being taken care of but also the hill areas and this is according to ms somnathan research foundation the most prominent one so don't need to worry are millets nutritious okay the nutritional contents of millets includes carbohydrates proteins fibers amino acids and various minerals so they not only include carbohydrates proteins but they also include fiber they also include amino acids and they include minerals so fiber is very important for you digesting the food amino acids basically the nh group they are basically the vital amines a b c d the water soluble and water insoluble and you also have minerals okay 
guys those of you are watching me so i am now providing you with the information which will bring a smile on your face and let us like i am focusing very much on article today so let me just open up another dimension for you okay every one of you must be knowing lion okay the apex predator in the forest ecosystem okay and every one of you must be knowing a being called as human i i hope that everyone knows what human being is i guess you are also human being right okay so if you if you compare the intestines of lion and a human if you compare the length of intestine of a lion and a human the intestine of a average human being is 3 times longer than that of the lion just imagine this the intestine of a average human being is 3 times longer than that of lion you know why because humans are made to digest plant fiber okay so if you cook roti of bajra and if you feed it to lion there are 100% chances that lion cannot digest that bajra ki roti and he will vomit whereas give humans everything you give humans meat you give humans plant based fibers you give humans animal based products we can digest god damn thing we can even digest the chinese on the footpaths so just imagine what we can do okay so discussions apart the intestine of a human being is 3 times more longer than that of the lion and as it is longer we can digest more and more plant fiber and the more fiber you eat the better is your digestion and nut nutrient wise millets will not only have carbohydrates they will not only have proteins they will also have fibers they will also have essential vitamins and minerals so they are very sought after okay so you just remember this line after this you this you don't need to remember i'm just plain simply reading it you don't have to remember this pearl millet one of the oldest cultivated varieties has found to be have higher protein content than rice maize and sorghum so it does have higher protein content than rice maize and sorghum while being comparable to that of barley according to various studies foxtail millet in rich is amino acid lysine winger millet has more crude fiber than wheat and rice so more fiber than wheat and rice more amino acids than the food grains so you can definitely advocate for consumption of millets per se and in india you know majority of us face hidden hunger majority of face do face protein energy malnourishment but we consume lot of fats we consume we like anywhere you go in india anywhere any goddamn corner of india you will find thumbs up coca cola and pepsi so basically if you drink 1 liter of coca cola how much sugar you are getting roughly 12 to 13 tablespoons of sugar you are getting so we have coca cola reaching the remotest hinterlands of india but we have some crops we have been growing certain crops which can negate all of that which can achieve good nutritional security and still we are not doing that so it's a thing of concern for india guys and you as future civil servants you will have this duty that you will have to advocate for this so please understand this issue very very holistically okay where are the nutrients stored you don't need to understand this that where are the nutrients stored in the uh, millets so like if i ask if i paint a normal picture so if i'm considering a cereal like this so a cereal has the outer covering okay the outer covering it is called as husk the outer covering is called as husk okay inside the husk you have the endosperm this is called as the endosperm okay endosperm is the part of the seed so endosperm basically becomes the part of the seed okay so if i'm just reading this okay <clears throat> each millet kernel consists of three major parts called pericap pericap is the outermost covering the endosperm and the germ so the outermost covering it is called as the pericap it is called as the husk then you have the endosperm and out inside that endosperm you have the major germ or the seed so you have outer layering pericap then you have inner layering called as endosperm and the third layering called as germ okay the pericap has a outer covering called the husk the husk and the pericap together protect the kernel from the inhospitable conditions so if anyone ask you how come millets are drought resistant how come millets can undergo climatic stress your one line answer should be that the pericap together with the kernel 
with the husk protect the millet from the harsh conditions. The pericap has a outer covering called the husk. The husk and the pericap together protect the kernel from inhospitable conditions, disease and physical damage. So what do you mean by this? If you are wearing a hat, so if I put a hat on my head like this, so consider that hat as my pericap. So that hat is my pericap and the outermost covering of that hat is called as the husk. So that husk and that kernel will protect my head from the harsh sun rays. So similarly you are having in millets. So the pericap has an outer covering called as the husk. So my cap will have an outer covering, the husk and the pericap. So the outer covering of hat and the pericap will protect the kernel from the inhospitable conditions, from the disease and from the physical damage. So it's just like you are protecting, you are donning a cap on your head. So your, your head is basically the endosperm. Inside that endosperm you have a germ and that endosperm and that germ are protected by the hat. Okay. The endosperm is the largest part of kernel and it is the storage center of the millets. So endosperm is the storage center of nutrients in the millets. Okay. So please get this very very properly. So the maida which you eat, okay, like you must be eating chole bature. So the bature is which you are eating, it is made up of maida. Maida is nothing but the endosperm of wheat. Okay, a good analogy so that you remember the things. So endosperm is basically maida. Okay, and the roti, the grain which you use is basically the germ. So germ is the wheat, whereas endosperm is the maida. Okay just for your comparison so that you get the things properly again i'm reiterating what protects the millets from the harsh condition the pericap together with the husk so if i'm putting the cap on my head like this so the outer layering of the cap with the structure of the cap will protect my head from the harsh rays of the sun so that is how the millets are being protected okay now let's understand the challenges how processing affects the nutrients okay so basically there are four steps in processing each step will affect the nutritional value and what are those four steps you need to remember these four steps okay processing <clears throat> okay processing and preparing millets for consumption can affect the nutrients in three ways enhance them suppress or remove them and ignore them okay how can it remove the nutrients? It can either enhance those nutrients, it can either suppress or remove them and it can ignore them. Process and preparing millets for consumption can affect nutrients in three ways. Enhancing them, suppressing or removing them or ignoring them. Okay. So how does it have? What are the three to four steps? Let us understand. The husk is removed from the grains because it is composed of cellulosic matter that human body cannot digest. So the husk is removed from the grains, the outer protecting lever is removed. Why? Because human body cannot digest it. And as the husk is removed, majority of the fiber is lost. Majority of the fiber is lost. So this is a process in which the fiber is getting lost. Okay. You don't have proper research on this. But yes, it has now been pointed out that if you remove the husk, the fiber is lost. Number two, the second Common step is to deteriorate the grain that is to remove any other outer covering and expose the seed. The second common step is to decorticate the grain that is remove any other outer covering and expose the seed. So basically you are removing all the outer covering and you are exposing the seed. So you are removing the husk, you are removing the endosperm and you are exposing the seed. So that is called as decorticate, decortication or decorticating the grain. Okay. Number third process that you have, the typical next steps are milling to grind the grains into flour and sieving them to remove large impurities including the bran. So you are milling them, you are basically grinding the grain and then you are sieving them. Okay, like you must have seen that you are in your household. So there must be a large sieve wherein the grains are tossed to remove the impurities including the bran. So this is the next step which also results into nutritional loss. And the fourth and the final step is a frequent last step is polishing. The longer the grains were milled, the more protein, fat and fiber contains the process being removed. The longer the grains were milled, the more protein, fat and fiber contents the process removed. Okay. Polishing 
is the process whereby brown rice for example is changed into white rice by rubbing of the bran and the jam so why do you need to do this why do you need to advocate for polishing because once you eat polished rice so polished rice tastes better and it looks better if any one of you has eaten brown rice so it does not taste that good it does not look that good and also brown rice will take more time to cook as compared to the polished white rice so it is basically for our taste buds it is basically for our time consumption that we are advocating for a less nutritionally rich meal so if you want to do this with millets it will lead to nutritional loss so number first you are basically removing the husk husk removal will result into what husk removal will result into loss of fiber then you are milling it you are grinding them it will again lead to nutritional loss then you are also polishing it so if you are polishing it again it will lead to nutritional loss and what is polishing polishing is the process wherein brown rice for example is changed to white rice by rubbing of the barn and the germ so if you rub it if you rub it it will result into nutritional loss and there is a case study it has been found that polishing removed 8 to 10 percent of grain weight and also removed 60 to 80 percent of iron magnesium phosphorus and potassium and manganese in the varieties of rice so roughly 60 to 80 percent of your nutrients are lost in polishing so this is not yet done okay yet rice polishing is considered desirable because as per 2009 study most consumers favor the resulting test and texture and prefer the shorter cooking time and relatives bit longer shelf life which can be achieved by removing the bran so guys this is not done you shouldn't polish the rice because if you polish the rice you are losing roughly 60 to 80 percent of your nutrient just for your test birds just for you properly having what a shorter cooking time so similar thing should not be done by the millets mind you yet we do not have any study which can advocate that whether polishing which can whether milling grinding or whether removing the husk leads to how much nutritional loss in millets i am again reiterating those of you who are watching me i have abhay rabi jagriti aditi those of you who are watching me and those who will watch me again up till now we don't have any proper study as to how the processing or the over processing of the grain results into nutritional loss of the millets okay we don't have any established study as of now only thing that we know is if you remove the husk it results into fiber loss if you do milling and grinding it also leads to nutritional loss and if you start polishing the grain it will result into nutritional loss with regards to the vital vitamins and minerals so these three things we know for sure but how much is the loss that we don't know why because there is no research so if i'm quickly summarizing this article why millets are important why because they require low input requirements in terms of water in terms of soil nutrients so they can survive droughts they can survive flash droughts they can survive flash droughts they can survive warm weathers they can grow on loamy soil and they can even grow on mountainous soil where you have marginal lands where the cost of maintenance of land is more than the value of the crops being grown so they can grow in that hilly areas too and why again they are more important because of nutrition india being a country which faces overnutrition malnutrition which faces overnutrition undernutrition which faces protein energy malnourishment which faces hidden hunger so all of these three things can be addressed by the millets so millets are very important from nutritional perspective because they have carbohydrates they have proteins they have fibers they have amino acids and they also have minerals but what is the threat over processing over processing will remove their fibery source over processing can remove their nutrients and over processing can also dwell away with their texture so that is the summary of this article very very important article and you will have to summarize this article at any cost okay now let us do the last article of today and the last article of today is very very important from science and tech perspective okay I know guys this session is going little bit long but I need to do this because I don't want any one of you being left out in prelims in mains. So just have faith in me and we will do this. Okay. Explaining the mitochondrial donation treatment. How baby has three parents. How baby has 
three parents okay so for this i am utilizing a little bit of board knowledge so that you get what do you mean by this okay so how can a baby have three parents so how can a baby have three parents okay so normally you have what if you if a baby is to be conceived so you require the sperm of the man okay to fertilize what sperm needs to fertilize the egg sperm needs to fertilize the egg okay so egg will come from woman okay so the sperm will fertilize the egg okay and as it fertilizes the egg you have formation of zygote zygote you will have formation of embryo very crude understanding of the human birth cycle okay fertilize zygote and then you will have embryo okay now just imagine that in this stage the egg of the woman is having some genetic disorder or the woman is suffering from some genetic disorder and if that genetic disorder order is mitochondrial mitochondrial means what that every cell has got its own power house so th imagine this is the human cell and in the center of cell you have mitochondria you have mitochondria so mitochondria is basically the power house of the cell okay so like the electricity which you get in house is manufactured from the thermal power plant from the nuclear power plant so every nucleus of the cell will have mitochondria and this mitochondria are basically the power house of the cell and if you have disorder in the mitochondria if you have mitochondrial disorders in the cell this cell will not function properly this cell will not function properly so if this cell is not functioning so enough energy will not be manufactured or enough energy will not be there for proper functioning of heart for, of liver of kidney of brain so you can suffer this as a prolonged lifeline conditions and it can affect your lifespan and it can result into death too so if a woman is suffering from such kind of issue that wherein this mitochondrial disorder is definitely passed to the new offspring so this is a genetic disorder which is definitely passed now what you can do you can do one thing okay you can take the egg of the woman from that egg you are basically removing what you are removing this genetic disorder and for removing this genetic disorder you are adding up the mitochondrial dna of another woman so you have two parents you have man and a woman but that woman is facing some problems with regards to mitochondrial disorders so from that egg you are removing that disorder and you are adding healthy new mitochondria from another parent guys i am giving a very crude explanation so that you get this on a ground level so from the third woman you are adding that defunct genetic mitochondrial disorder you are removing that and now that baby is being born it is of three parents how so because the mitochondrial disorder which this woman was facing is now taken care of by the third woman whereas the genetic material which the baby will get will be of those two parents of that man and the woman so if i am a woman okay just imagine that i am a woman i am facing this disorder but i don't want the genetic material of another woman in my baby so i don't want to utilize the entire egg of the another woman so what i will do is from that another woman's egg i will only take out the relevant mitochondrial genetic material and that will be added to my egg so that my baby gets the qualities of the of the father and of me so that that baby can be rightly called as our baby whatever gene expressions the baby will have will be of both of us and not of that other woman so who can go for this surgery or who can go for this uh, treatment if a parent is facing such kind of issue and that parent does not want the genetic material or the gene expression of another woman in their baby of another person in their baby so this is very very important okay so let's start to understand what what is this headline news and why this is so goddamn important okay <clears throat> the announcement that a baby was born using three persons dna in uk on thursday caused stir that news of this kind was expected to evoke okay the baby technically has three parents so three child baby deriving the mitochondria from a donor part from the genetic material 
from the biological parents so mitochondria from a donor and genetic material the dna from the parents so the third woman will supply what mitochondria the parents will supply will what they will supply the genetic material pioneering technology uses to facilitate this in order to prevent the child from inheriting the mother's mitochondrial disease okay what why did the baby need three parameters okay the baby carried most of its dna from its parent and a minor percent from the donor whose mitochondria has been used while fertilizing the egg okay <clears throat> now why mitochondria are so goddamn important you need to understand this mitochondria are basically the powerhouse of the cells they generate energy and thus are also responsible for cell function in the human body certain defects might occur impacting the way mitochondria produces energy for the cells especially the in the energy hungry tissues of brain nerves muscles kidneys heart and liver and thereby impacting the cell function so in your body which are the most energy intensive organs you have brain you have kidney you have heart muscles so all of this will require heavy amount of energy and if your powerhouse is failing so your body cannot function okay when the mitochondria are impaired and do not produce sufficient energy it affects how organs function leading to a broad assortment of symptoms across the body including a brain damage organ failure and muscle wastage so if you don't have proper functioning of mitochondria in body it can result into brain damage it can result into organ failure and also muscle wastage so muscle stunting okay in this case mother had a mitochondrial disease she was intent on not passing on to her baby so but naturally if i am the mother so i don't intend to pass on this disease to my baby she also did not want to have a donor egg for the baby would carry the genetic material of the donor so if i am the mother i don't want the genetic material of another woman in my baby so what i will do is i will just take the mitochondrial part of her egg i will insert it into my egg and my baby will be cured of that mitochondrial disease and additionally my baby will get my genetic expression okay what is the scientific process so let us understand the process okay <clears throat> baby's biological father sperm was used to fertilize the egg from the biological mother who has a mitochondrial disease and that a third female donor with real mitochondria separately then the nuclear genetic material from the donor's egg is removed and replaced with the genetic material from the biological parent so from the donor's egg the nuclear genetic material from the donor's egg is removed so all of the nuclear material from the donor's egg is removed and replaced with the genetic material from the biological parents so out of that donor's dna all of the nuclear material is removed it is replaced with the genetic material of the biological parents the final product the egg which has the genetic material from the parents and the mitochondria from the female donor is implanted in the uterus and carried to full term to yield a baby who will be free from the mother's mitochondrial disease this process is termed as mitochondrial donation treatment mdt so this is called as what mitochondrial donation treatment mdt so what you are doing you are taking the donor's egg from that donor's egg you are removing all the genetic material and which genetic material is being added the mother's genetic material and then the sperm of the father is used to fertilize this and then this egg is planted in the uterus of the mother so that the baby has got the genetic expression of the mother and the father and not of the donor the name of the process is called as mitochondrial donation treatment okay okay so this sums up this article nothing more significant than this but please understand this is a fairly new process this is called as mitochondrial donation treatment mdt so it will be a three parent baby how the three parent baby you will be utilizing the egg of what of the donor and the mother so the from the donor's egg complete genetic material will be removed the mother's genetic material will be transferred from the mother's egg to that egg that egg will be fertilized from the father's sperm and it will be planted into the uterus of the mother 
and now the baby which will be growing into the mother's womb will have genetic expression of the mother and the father but it will not have the mitochondrial disease which it was bound to inherit if the egg or if the mitochondrial material of the mother was present in that egg so three parent baby okay guys so this sums up today's article guys i know that this session was a little bit long but i hope that you have got all the issues very very properly and i hope that you will summarize the articles very very properly i'm again reiterating my name my name is pritesh mathurkar okay you can reach out to me on telegram by doing a global search at the hindu analysis zone the name of the channel is haz hindu analysis zone i want each and every one of you to make it special okay please join this channel because the moment this session ends i will be uploading the pdfs there and there itself okay so guys on the behalf of study iq is english i extend my warmest regards to everyone i hope sorry i have faith that each one of you is now focusing properly on your current affairs and that you are keeping in consonance with me okay so all the best to everyone keep on studying hard and smart only studying hard will not do you will have to study hard and smart so please do that and have consistency and arise arise awake and stop not till the goal is reached see you all tomorrow sharp at 